number theory to meet uh, all the requirements. So this is sorry, used to meet the requirements and match. So, so what are these microstates? 
What are we counting? So when you say that black holes have entropy, what is it that we're counting in this form? Um, and these will be the Fourier coefficients that I'm interested in. And so I want to be able to describe this number. Now, in general, this is a difficult question. So we don't know how to answer this generically. And as a theorist, uh, we start making assumptions or simplifications to try to understand when this formula uh, actually makes sense, when do we have control over it, and when can we be uh, precise about the equality. So the simplifications that we do. The, can I ask something? Yes. So for the description of microstates, do you need a precise formula for the entropy, or how does it work? Uh, I'll show you how it works when I get to the CFT part. Uh, because the, the part that we care more about explaining, or well, it depends on, we, we try to take the, the things order by order. So uh, we first have to account for this piece. And once we get this asymptotics correct, then we care about what the dots are saying as well. And do you know the dots precisely? Uh, it depends on the type of black hole. So I'll tell you in a second when do we have control over the dots. So generically, we don't, um, because we have to be careful. Um, so yeah, let me let me carry on a little bit, and I'll come back to why. Uh, as I start making simplifications, it's because of how can I control this, and how can I control making sense of this quantity as well. So uh, the important simplifications of this is a. is to make, basically make the solution uh, supersymmetric. So consider a, a certain class of black holes uh, that are supersymmetric black holes. This means that uh, the black holes will be contained inside of a theory that doesn't just have gravity, but it will also have uh, other type of matter fields. It will have gauge fields, it will have fermions, it will have a gravitino. There will be a lot of um, more content in it. And it gives extra power to the theory, to the solution, because the solution can have enhanced symmetries. And when you make them supersymmetric, meaning that it will be preserved under uh, certain transformations, uh, one of the important features is that it takes the, the system uh, to zero temperature. So generically, this formula is always true, even the black hole can have some finite temperature. But uh, when people in physics that tell you, oh, I have a supersymmetric solution, the temperature is automatically zero. So we're studying what we will call the ground state. Okay? I'm just looking at the lowest um, energy configuration that our system can have in some, in some sense. But there's still finite uh, chemical potentials. But I'm looking at, at zero temperature. So what does that gain in the system? So from the geometry point of view, uh, it enhances symmetries. Uh, it will give me basically an SL2R worth of uh, killing vectors in the geometry. And this is attributed to uh, a portion of the space time looks like anti visitor 2. I'll write it in a second so you'll see what the geometry the looks like. This is independent. It will be times something compact. But there's always a factor of radius 2. It would not matter the number of dimensions. So that's why gravity is very robust from this point of view. So it's always, so let's say the black hole is in d dimensions, uh, this will be times m of d minus 2. Uh, usually, the typical case is that this is just a, a sphere of d minus 2. Um, so that's part of the geometry. So the ABS2 part is, is very, very robust. There's no counter example for this, and there's actually theorems approved in four and five dimensions that have, always has to be the case. Um, and the nice thing as well, but as well challenging, is that the formula as the H uh, doesn't vanish. So you still, the size of the black hole as you take the temperature to zero is still very big. So it changes, it's the, how it depends on the parameters changes, but it's still, you can still have a very, very, very large black hole. Uh, a lot at zero temperature. And so I still have an entropy to account, which makes my, my initial question not empty, which is good. 
Uh, but it also, from a statistical point of view, uh, this is very puzzling because uh, we're used to, in physics, of having statistical systems that have a unique ground state. So we, we need to look for systems. So there's a need of systems with huge uh, residual entry. And this is not generic. So the gas of particles in this group Tell me what the ground state is. It's like basically only particles at the bottom of, on, the, on the floor. And that's the only state that they can have. So it's like there's not much that you can play around with. In mo most cases, the, the ground state has very, uh, it's just unique. So there's just one. Uh, so this is a little bit challenging. But okay, but then supersymmetry, the other thing that it, uh, that it will do for me is that it will protect this quantity. So, so in cases where, where we have supersymmetry, uh, it's expected, so with supersymmetry, just from our knowledge from uh, quantum field theory, uh, it's expected that this quantity D micro is well defined. And basically, an index. So it's a protected quantity of the theory, and so you should be able to compute it. It has a, it's meaningful uh, from that point of view. So that's why we like uh, this type of, of set, okay? Because there's a chance of having a good definition of what this coefficient is. If you're at finite temperature, you have pocket radiation, the heat capacity of the system is negative, there's all sorts of instabilities, and so it's not so clear how to make this definition very precise. But if you have supersymmetry, uh, then there's an expectation that this should be controlled by an index, and so we should be good to go. Okay, so let me write down a little bit more about the geometry, so how these black holes look like, um, because it will be useful as I try to translate things. So the micro is integral number. What's that? The micro is yeah. integer. So we, we have to get at it. So we have logarithm of an integer to be some series. But this so logarithm of integer cannot vary. When, when I get here, you'll see how these integers become uh, basically, they, the integers get approximated by exponentials. There will be large integers. So I'll be looking at partitions, and I'll be approximating the coefficients of those partitions, and usually they have an exponential growth, those numbers of partitions. So, but yeah, so that's why the dot dot dots here should complete it into an integer. So, so it's, it's all about the asymptotics. So you have many integers, not, not one, but sequence. No, 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 but let's say, so this number will be like 10 to the, whatever favorite number you have, to the 300, 323, okay? So, so, okay, so the log of this thing is 323, but then 323 is pretty close in some limit to 300, and that's what this thing is counting, the 300, and then the dot, dot, dot is like, or, or, or the approximation, the a over 4, will give you 300 from 27, and then the dot, dot, dot adds it up. That's how you approximate, basically. You're, we're going to look at approximation formulas for the coefficient up here. That's where, uh, I'll do some right back for some that maybe will make you feel more comfortable, maybe. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, yeah, that, when, you, when you're in gravity, you're doing a, an approximation of that. Uh, so, uh, to justify why, what type of Fourier coefficients I'm looking at, what type of the microbes I'll be interested in, uh, let's have an example in the back of my mind, in our minds, like an example of a black hole that is like, the, it's my favorite example basically, but it has all the key features uh, that are important. So, uh, the example is a 4D uh, dionic black hole. Dionic here just basically means that it can have electric and magnetic charges, and it's very closely related. For those of you that are more uh, string theory uh, and moderated, it's closely related to the D1, D5, uh, P system. I don't know what this means, it doesn't matter, but just so you know. Um, so this is the original, uh, it's a very similar to the original strong 
point your graph out. Well, so I'm in four dimensions, uh, three plus one and one in the uh, It's going. To, I'm going to consider a supersymmetric black hole, which basically means that its mass is a combination is equal to a combination of its charges. So this is what it means to be a Susi. Well. Yeah, it depends on how. In the simple cases, it should just be n equal q, but because I have a collection of charges, it will look like that. Yeah. In the simplest case, it all depends on how you combine, put in the field strengths in your theory. But yeah, like the typical thing is to say n equal q. It's when you take all the charges equal to length. But okay. Um, okay. So how does the geometry look like? So. The line element for this black hole. Uh, I'll only write down the near horizon to emphasize how this area is too. So when you go very close to the black hole, uh, the metric looks like this. So there's a time coordinate, a radial coordinate. So this portion of the geometry, this is the ADS2 portion of it, and this is just a sphere. Uh, there's some field strength supporting this geometry, so there's some set of uh, electric uh, gauge fields for which uh, it's a two-form that is proportional to the volume of the ADS2, so it's some TDR uh, wedge part. And there's a magnetic component. So we just call magnetic charges anything that is proportional to the volume of the AES part, and the magnetic charges are the ones that are proportional to the volume of the two spheres. Um, now, the equations of motion, so you put this into uh, this, uh, this, this is a solution of a specific supergravity theory, and the equations of motions are going to tell you that the sizes of the ADS, so these are constant and basically control the radius of curvature of the solution. Uh, and the equations of motion will tell you that both of them have to be the same. And they have to be related to the charges here, which is basically to numerical coefficients. So in this talk, I'm not going to keep track of there's factors of two and stuff that nobody cares about. Well, people do. No, it's important. It's very important, but it's not important for, for now. Uh, so this is how uh, it looks like, the, the solution. Uh, now, if I compute the entropy, so now let me erase this part. So let's compute the entropy of the solution. Uh, the, it's just the area of the horizon. Uh, the horizon is basically uh, this two-sphere. So this is the area of the horizon divided by 4G plus dot dot dot. And so the area of the horizon is just 4 pi L squared divided by 4G. And so it's roughly going to go like uh, q squared, p squared, q dot. Okay? So this is the, I'm omitting factors of pi, and the charges are normalizing units of L pi. But, okay, this is what I want you to remember. Um, the area, the entropy of this black hole, the leading contribution, so the leading contribution to the entropy has this form. Now, when are the dot dot dots not important? So when can I not, when can I say this is the biggest contribution and these other things are tiny? Uh, I can say that uh, basically when the area is much, much bigger than G Newton, and this will basically translate, and if I look at the solution as well, and translate it into the parameters, it's basically telling me that the charges uh, have to be big, and 
and as well the discriminant that I have in here, the thing inside of this square root as well has to be big. So all the sizes that you have in the geometry have to be big for this to be the biggest contribution. And for order to, to say, oh, I can neglect the dots, this is the leading part of the form. Okay? So this is when the approximation is valid. So it's valid. Approximation. And this piece, don't make me erase it, because I'll keep on referring back to this part. Okay? So this is when this formula is. Great. So that, that's what the black hole tells me. So this is this is black hole physics. So now we're all expert in black holes. Okay. In 20 minutes. <laughs> um, this is what I want you to, to keep in mind about this black hole. Okay, so how do we explain this? What are, what are types of microstates? What are types of statistical systems that will satisfy this minimal requirement? That I look at statistical systems for which uh, the entropy has uh, this type of being. So how do we do that? So in, in, the, in a modern era, the way we try to understand uh, the physics of black holes and the gravitational physics uh, is by using uh, holography. So I'll give you holography is basically a dictionary between a rotational system and, uh, and a field theory. And I'll tell you what the dictionary is. How do we understand these black holes uh, within the string theory? So how does string theory tell us to understand the, the microstates of this particular configuration? Okay, so um, so I'll have a rota rotational variables. So I'll have gravity on one side, so I'll have whole parameters, and on the other side I'll have a formal field theory. I'm happy to elaborate here on how we get this dictionary, but I do want to get to the math portion. So, so if you just be like, sure, fine, whatever, uh, that's okay. But yeah, I'm happy to offline just tell you how we come up with these food will look like a black box, right? Okay, anyway. So so how do we map this to conformal field theory day? Okay, so what is the map? Uh, so the first thing, uh, let's say, so so Q squared. Q squared was the uh, was one of the charges of the black hole. Q squared uh, I'll map it uh, to a variable that I'll call M which is basically the eigenvalue of the operator L0 of the reversal algebra. So it's basically telling me something about the energy of the system. Then I have P squared. And P squared will be mapped uh, to C, which is the central charge So this will be, in particular, I'll be looking at how the system goes to a CFT2. So this will be the central charge of, uh, of the Vera Servo that controls your system. Uh, Q dot P, and here as well I'm being sloppy with numerical coefficients and so forth, uh, it gets mapped to, I'll call this parameter L, and it's basically the eigenvalue of J0, which basically, uh, in, in most of the systems that I'll have in mind, I actually have a Verasoro times Pitts Moody algebra, and it's basically, I do one Pitts Moody, and, and this J0 is basically this, the eigenvalue of this, um, of the J0 component of Pitts Moody. Yeah, the n equal 2 super algebra, yeah, so the n equal 2 super algebra has uh, U1 Pitts Moody, which is a natural one that you here. Uh, and then the fact that I have here supersymmetry tells me that the relevant object to look at here uh, is a little genus of this uh, superconformal field theory. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about this. And then the entropy then of this black hole that is supersymmetric. Uh, should correspond to the logarithm of 
in my graph on this side. Okay, so this is the expectation. Based, based on all of this input, this should be true. What's the CFT meaning of this DMI It's counting the number of BPS states. Uh, so it's basically this. Yeah. So D micro is basically the Fourier coefficients of this elliptic genes. So this should be true. So if you put all of these ingredients in that are part of how we understand holography, and the conclusion that we should get out of this is that the, the number of BPS states in this theory should match to the entropy of the black hole, or at least should say something about the entropy of this black hole. Okay? So the micro depends on L and L. Yeah, yeah. So I'll write it in. Okay, that's good. Yes. That was, I was asking, you have a series yeah. of numbers, not yeah. just one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in the sense of, yeah, here I have q and p and q.p. So I have three parameters that the entropy depends on, and here I'll have three parameters in which. But the calls are parameters. But it gives you all that. But, but it gives you all one number. Like for fix n, c, and l. The numbers are it's entropy 22. characterized by these three exactly. numbers. Exactly. So given this, these these parameters, how many microstates do you have? So you fix it's like a microcanonical ensemble type like, uh, question. And cuts would be is a fine or or not. What type of cuts would it? It's a compact one. Uh, but it's the one that goes in into the multiplet of that equal to uh,
but oh, and then I should, uh, yeah. So this, I noticed that I was going to. So let me call this one. Hat. Yeah. Which one do you want me to put the hat to the central charge or this? The central charge. Okay, the central charge. One. Okay, so let's. Then M will be C U R two C U R two. Um. Yes. Uh, C is roughly six M. Um, yeah. And, super, and the, the supersymmetric algebra relates C to six M. Uh, but this is the index of the of the form, and K is the weight. Uh, and yeah, and this is the basic property it has. It also has a spectral flow transformation that we're not going to use, but there's there's a shift symmetry as well and set uh, by tau that we labels. It's an isomorphism of the of the algebra. Okay, so but this formula, this transformation is already pretty powerful because based on this modular property of the of the forms, you can already extract some information about how the micro uh, uh, behaves. Okay, and this is how, in string theory, people got started very excited about how the uh, how the dictionary of holography works and why it's so impressive. Uh, so let's go through that. Well, maybe I'm not going to redirect it because I'm probably already running out of time. So let me steal a bit of the number theory. Uh, you would put the head on the C. C head C as well. C head. C head the system. Ah, the, sorry. Yes. That, uh, is it what um, C is in the exponent there also C? Yeah, it's, it's no, 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 Most 
polar means the most negative. Yeah, the most negative. So in, in examples, for instance, if you grab the Jacobi form uh, phi zero one, which will show up a bunch uh, delta zero is uh, minus one, and it's because this form starts with y plus y to the minus one, and then there's a ten, and then there's how, higher powers of q. And so this guy is the one that gives you this this maximum polarity term here. But okay. Uh, but what's what's nice uh, about so basically this formula of course assumes that you have a negative polarity term otherwise it doesn't it doesn't hold otherwise the form will just have polynomial growth uh, but if you if you have a polar term then the forms can have exponential growth and the exponential growth is determined by the most polar term and then the discriminant of the state that you have in mind okay so. So you tell me what the values of n, l, and m are, and what is the most polar term. So basically the first term, you tell me what the first term in the sum is, and then what state you want, and then it will be approximated by this. But okay, but when is this a good approximation? So as you go through the steps to derive that equation, there's as well some assumptions. There's, you're, you're approximating the, the function. <laughs> And so the validity here basically the magnitude of delta uh, is much bigger. Well, delta, the discriminant, this guy by the time has to be always positive, uh, and it's valid if the magnitude of delta is much bigger than the magnitude. Here. So that's when, if you don't assume anything about the Jacobi form besides the fact that this state exists, you assume that this state exists and, it's, and it transforms in those ways, then you're going to get this as a good approximation if you're in this regime. And so uh, if you plug in now, now I have this dictionary here. And so if you put in the, the, the maps, if instead of talking about n, m, and L, I plug back in what Q, P, and Q dot P is, and I put in all that, like how everything translates into holography, what you'll find is that this, if I take the log of D, um, well, up to this numerical factors that I haven't been kept in mind, basically the log of D is the square root times delta, and as, as we put everything in, it will be like p squared, p squared, minus p dot p. It's easier to see uh, when you're just sloppy, forget about the L. N is basically, uh, oh sorry, there's just one power that down here. So now it makes sense. Okay, so forget about the L because it's easier to see it that way. So N was like q squared, P was like m squared, and so this this square root basically goes like the square root of m times m, and so it's qp. And the the numerical factors also work out beautifully. So as I said, I haven't given you, I haven't been keeping track of all of them, but they all fit in beautifully into this formula. So this is how an integer looks like a square root, like will look just like a real number. And it's because you're approximating it. So in the Jacobi form, these are just integers, but then you're approximating them by an exponential. <laughs> and it matches. And it's a beautiful match. But now we have to be careful. Um, because this, I'm using an equation, this equation in the CFT was used in this regime. Uh, and so, okay, so delta, Basically, what this regime is basically telling me, if I go back my back my tracks and I kind of see what's going on, uh, this is basically telling me that there's going to be a hierarchy uh, between Q and P. It's going to tell me that uh, this formula is valid if Q squared is much bigger uh, than M squared. If I did not. I hope I did not screw up with any of the back. <laughs> but, 
But the, the validity of the, of the derivation using modular variance or modular covariance uh, implies that p squared is much bigger than, than p squared. And it's fine, but it's not quite what I needed. Because I needed uh, a validity when both of them were big, and, and they can be a particularly uh, parametrically equal in, in size. So it's not quite satisfying that the validity of this asymptotic formula puts a hierarchy between the two, the two terms in here. It tells me that q squared has to be bigger than p squared. And the CFT language is where people tell you that the energy of the system, this is valid when the energy of the system is much bigger than the central charge of the system. So it's an asymptotic formula for large energies. And it's large energies compared to the central charge. Uh, but gravity tells me that I should have this amount of states in general. Now, I should also have this when energies are comparable to the central charge and then both of them. Uh, and this is the puzzle that we have. This is the new puzzle that we have. So we, we found that using modular forms... Oh, you need to divide delta zero by m. Because yeah, I have to, that's why I was being... Yeah, I mean, in square root as well. Ah, sorry, here I forgot yeah. to put it in the square root. The zero divided by m is something like constant, uh, if I is small. Is it, that's why I'm hesitating how I wrote it. When we wrote it in the paper, I wrote it differently. But the, the condition here, let me write it differently because um, I decided this morning when I was preparing, I decided to change how I was doing it so that I didn't have to introduce more notation. Uh, but basically, the condition here is this I know for sure. This is that n has to be much bigger than m. So let me just write it like that. Uh, because I know that, yeah, if you... Yeah, for sure, this is a... I, let me not write it in terms of the determinants. But uh, the, the, when I do the saddle point approximation, the saddle point approximation is going to be valid uh, when this is holding. Ah, no, but I know, okay. Yeah, this is why, okay. Now we can write it in terms of delta, but the problem yeah, so this, this delta zero, the maximal polarity of these states, but it's, just a, it's not obvious from how I wrote it here. Okay, no, it's, it goes like minus m squared. So the max, for a weak Jacobi form, the maximal polarity yeah, that you can have is minus m squared. So yeah, so it's still true if you write it as delta m delta zero is fine. It's just that I didn't tell you how I'm not uh, scaled with m. And, and then we would be happy, right? Sorry, okay, that's why. I, but both of them are this, so this is supposed to be much bigger. And so this goes like m squared, and this goes like n times n, and that's why it's the same as n much bigger than n. Okay. Good. But yeah, the maximal polarity of the Jacobi form. I have another question. Yes. Yeah, the saddle point method is that the same what we would call the Valdemar circle method, or is it something? No, it's basically that. Yeah. Is it, uh, you can write it as an exact uh, summation, like uh, an ex there's an exact form of the of the circle method, and then I'm approximating. I'm looking at what the leading part. I th yeah. My understanding is basically it comes from the same part. But in physics, we attribute this, like Cardi, John Cardi taught us this, and so then we we use the we give this formula the name the Cardi. Well, Cardi. 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 Cardi condition of it. Cardi. Uh, he's a physical physicist. And Cardi condition is the same. Yeah, it's the same. Same. Okay. What part of the Cardi condition? That's on CFT. Okay. Yeah, it's a CFT person. So John Cardi. Uh, he was at Oxford at the time that did this. So, okay. But yeah. Um, Okay, anyway, so when you hear a physicist talk about the Cardi formula, they just mean that's what they mean. Okay, okay. but uh, the, puzzle is, the puzzle that we have nowadays is that, okay, this is fine, this is really elegant, this expression has the same functional dependence as the expression for the black hole, but there's a mismatch in the regimes of validity. And we do want to get, because we want to explain the dot dot dots, okay? So this is where you're like, okay, this is fine, you've got the same, so this is basically looking like the area of the black hole. 
But the problem is that as you correct this formula, starting from, from this, so we're going to be, if you start correcting this formula in this regime, these corrections are not going to match those corrections because you're expanding the, the equations in different regimes. And so then the dots don't agree. And why do they don't agree? Because here this is an assumption, and over there it's a different assumption. So, so they're not going to agree, unless some other magic happens. And you can see in cases where we're confident, the dots don't agree because the expansions are uh, in, with different ratios. So the question is then, okay, so how can we obtain, uh, or what are the classes, basically the, the math question is, what are the classes of modular forms that will have this type of exponential behavior, but in the regime that I care about? So the regime that I care about, so I want to obtain this D micro, or N, the order of m, and both of them much bigger than 1. So I, I want to understand why the classes of functions for which its Fourier coefficients are of these forms. And what are the corrections, and can I match those corrections with the predictions that the gravitational theory has? Okay? So that's, the main, that's where I started butchering math. So, so that's my premise. Three minutes left. No, but uh, you, you started later. Oh, but okay, but not that. <laughs> not that you started late. seven minutes after six. Okay. But okay, but I hope now the premise, this, this is basically what we're doing, okay? We're trying to understand what are the classes of functions for which we can have this exponential growth with this like, type of square root behavior, but in this region. And this is where the Siegel module would form. So now let's go to our number. Okay. So um, the, the example was relevant because um, I want to think about the, the counting. So I was looking at these 4D black holes that were motivated by the D1P5 system. Uh, but for these 4D black holes, people can count all of the one quarter, these are one quarter DPS states uh, and string theory. Uh, and using various technologies and things, like people can actually count how many DPS states there are. They can tell me exactly uh, what the elliptic genus is. But they actually did it uh, doing something pretty clever. Uh, which, from the premise, it should be clear why they kind of had to do that. So notice that uh, I'm doing something that is not very, gravity is forcing me to consider something that is not very natural from the mathematics or the field theory point of view. It's asking me to consider m to be very big. m usually, if you look at your favorite Jacobi form, is like 1, 1 half, 3 halves, like theta function. It's a like pretty low index. So I need to have a characterization of modular forms that have arbitrarily large index. And so how do we do that? Well, the same way how we characterize the states with large energies, we average over it. We introduce a fugacity associated to the index, and then we're going to do statistics on that index. So the way that the, you count these states, and in particular if you want to know the counting for large M, is that you introduce an extra fugacity to your problem. <coughs> you call it growth. And so now we're going to sum over M and L. And the sum is going to be over the Jacobi forms that have a given index. And we're going to add an extra fugacity associated to that, uh, to that index that is e to the t pi by rho. Okay? So we're going to average over theories. If each index corresponds to a specific uh, theory, now you're averaging over theories and we're going to see the typicality in the averaging. What is the statistics of the average? And so the famous example here uh, is given by the it's 
goes by the DDB formula, a string theory that I have for lambda for lambda uh, formula. And the object that counts this is the Ibusa cup, or one over the Ibusa cup. So the set of this generating function is basically one over, um, I think we prefer to call it, call it chi -tem. It's one over chi -tem, uh, the Ibusa cusp form. And this is where most of string theorists brag, like, oh, we know how to count microstates of supersymmetric levels. And it's because they know this, and then they can match all sorts of things. So here, uh, things work really well, and you might say, OK, why, why do we have so much success in string theory for this case of the Gusa cusp form? So the Gusa cusp form is pretty remarkable, because it's not just a generating function over your average over all of this. So as you all of you know, it has a really cool property, and is that it's invariant under the exchange of tau and rho. Okay, and that property is key to get what I want because now if we look back here. So this these now are going to be basically, they're going to be contained, there's still the coefficients contained in here. Okay, so now, so they're basically the, I ran out of space here, but they're basically the, the Fourier coefficients here. Uh, but now I'm saying there's an exchange symmetry between tau and rho. This implies that there's an exchange symmetry between m and n. And so if I have an asymptotic formula, when n is much bigger than m, guess what? You're going to get an asymptotic formula when m is much bigger than n, and in particular when m is of the order of n. So this exchange symmetry is key to then have Cardi like growth <coughs> for m much bigger than m and m than n and m of the order of n should be one. Anything. They just have to be large. And you can make them of different orders even, but the discriminant basically just has to be big. And you're going to be assured to get what you want. Uh, how did you conclude the m of, m of order n? Because uh, originally you had it for n much bigger than n. Like yeah, but then it's kind of, I'll, I, I can tell you, it's not obvious, actually, and there's examples where you have to be careful, but in this case it works out that for the entire regime, it, it goes through. So, because this is, yeah, you have to be a bit careful. For sure that the opposite will be true, but the intermediate regime is a little bit more delicate, but uh, you can, since we are, well, I'm a physicist and I'm sloppy, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that, that, that. But, uh, but it does, it does. You can do a very careful job and the, and the coefficients do be taken in this intermediate region. And so it's like, oh, that's great. Uh, so this is an example that the string theorists love and we studied it to death and this thing has been like decoded and written in 3,000 different ways and, and studied as much as we can study it. Um, but, but if you think about it, the key at the end of the day was roughly this. And so then, your paper, and we said, are there other forms such that we get S? Almost all the forms. Almost <laughs> all the forms. We have That's to be a bit that. careful. So <laughs> this is where we got super excited. So we started to study your paper, and we're like, okay, let's try to understand if this was enough. Because the first thing that we had to make sure is like, is the exchange symmetry enough to assure, uh, as Arnav was saying, maybe you want to be careful what happens here. Because it's like, okay, can we can we digest this? Can we go through your kind of list of all, all the functions that you have generated and understand what are the actual requirements for us to get all that we want? Okay, and then what will be the gravitational interpretations of those forms? So you you give us to us a bunch of forms, and what we're trying to do is first understand this requirement and then go through the entire dictionary. So we're kind of going backwards. Understanding the forms, understanding the CFT, understanding the gravity center, and, and the 
tell you this is the black hole that you've been secretly, secretly studying. Or sort of. But so okay, so there's um, I don't have much time. Um, but basically, the the thing that was very powerful. So so let me just for the rest that don't know which forms I'm talking about. Um, so usually, so so the Husserl cusp form is not unique. There's there's a bunch of them. So even so so chi ten. So chi ten. So this is something external for CFT. You have just not one CFT, but collection. Yeah, CFT it's a collective by M, and if you look for the multi Exactly. And so so then um, yeah, but. Okay, so let me say a bit more something on the mathematical side, and then I'll come back to the to how we understand in, in the CFT. So chi instead is one uh, of a ring of what's called single modular forms. So this exchange symmetry, together with S L two set, generates the group uh, S P four set. So this is basically, from my point of view, is a chain of rho and tau plus S L two set. Plus spectral flow. Uh, so that, that's enough to, to generate the group. Uh, but here as well, you can have even with an SP4 set. Uh, other examples that I like are chi 35, and there's another form, chi 12, that is also pretty nice. Uh, the Einstein's ones I don't care much about because they don't, they're just fully really obvious, so they're kind of boring. But chi 35, this is the only anti it's only what? The only anti invariant function. Well, I'll square well, it. Well, I, 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 can, I can square it. This yeah, it's the only one with the odd uh, weight. Um, but but I, I also like it because you guys were it as an exponential one. So, but then the, the thing, the, the, the nice way you have to think about the problem is like, okay, so, but there's just a rainbow fan, there's not too many, but then you can ask, okay, if I give you a Jacobi form, so let's say that I just give you the index, the left genus, how do I generate a family? And that's how, or basically how do I construct something that is single modular or paramodular? How do I, I generate the families of atoms? How do, I, how do I make something that I'm summing over M and it has some nice properties? Uh, so there's where uh, the work of the example they tell me so they tell me how to build exponential whiffs of a C uh, Jacobi form, which actually can also be nearly holomorphic. It doesn't have to be weak or holomorphic. So it can, in most general cases, it can be a nearly holomorphic uh, form of like zero and then like T. And what they tell me is that if you do this exponential whiff, which I'll write in a second, uh, you'll get. Um, Paramodular form where the group is basically gamma plus t, and the only modification in, in, from this point of view, the only thing that is happening is that uh, rho goes to uh, tau uh, over t, and tau goes to rho times t, and then the SLT set transformation. So the index t of the Jacobi form uh, basically just modifies a bit this exchange symmetry, that's there, which is not very, it's interesting enough. But okay, so what, what happens is that you're building um, basically, so, so you, you'll be able to build uh, a paramodular form that will, that will be based on so one, you will give me a representative And it will look that they have uh, the, that I know what, how they transform, 
that, that's also pretty important. Uh, but you guys tell me what are all the divisors of these functions. Because now like, I know how to compute the Fourier coefficients using the Humbert surfaces that you have. So the, the, the part that we exploited the most are the fact that all divisors are known. And so and they're described by a set of uh, Humbert surfaces. And the, the data is just basically also all encoded in the seed. If I know the seed, then I know the locations of all the zeros and the poles. And, and that's where, uh, that's really what's controlling this Cardi growth here. So by understanding the behavior of these uh, Humbert surfaces. So for the case of Chi 10, uh, this guy has Humbert surface H11. And using this, this property, I, I don't have the time to explain it because I'm, right now I'm oof, super over time. Uh, but basically, the Cosa Pass form has H11, and this is the key to get all I need. Uh, and, but there's, in the paramodular group, there's several that have just H11 as their. Eight. Okay, there's the Calabria threefold. Uh, there's eight modular forms. There's eight modular forms. I think I only spotted four, so I'm missing four. So you have to tell me what it is. It's a little white paper with Fabio Cleary. Okay, I'll take a look. Wait, 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 it's a full classification. Okay. Including including Hecke Congress of those. Great. If I don't find the paper, I'll go with you. Because in the paper that both of you have Yes, 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 there's only four. I only found four? Yes, yes, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four, but right, you will for Congress of those. I'm doing it, which okay, maybe, maybe it would be very okay. interesting. I'm missing four then. Okay, great. Um, but that, that was exciting. So we know that H11, basically, if you have H11, you're going to have, roughly speaking, the same features as Chi 10. So there's nothing too special about the Ibusa Cosmo from that point of view. Uh, and we checked, you actually have this behavior. And now what we're trying to do is understand okay, so what is the black hole? So I know what the form is, and I know it has this beautiful behavior, but I need to understand what the black hole is. Uh, but then, for instance, if you look at Chi-35, uh, Chi-35 has two Humbert surfaces, and that actually spoils it, because they intersect, and it gives you uh, it gives you too much growth. You get what an instructor call a high and north type growth. So it's kind of interesting as well to see so, what that So Chi-35, that's, that does not that does not that no. work in this. Uh, in yeah, it has the it it, okay. it, it has this behavior uh, in, in this regime, and you might think because you have exchange symmetry, it will have the opposite. But because the surfaces are crossing, so you mean um, reducible device in some sense. Yeah. Then then the, you have to the contour as you perform the contour over which you're integrating. Uh, you have to take into account another residue, and that spoils the growth. And so. Uh, so the, the contour, in some sense, or how you expand the infinite product, uh, breaks the, uh, the exchange symmetry. So you have to be careful as you're expanding that the asymptotics is not compatible with the symmetry. Um, and so Chi 35 doesn't have it. But also, the, like one example that we discussed a bit in our paper was Chi 12 or Chi 10. Because um, from what we understood, from what Gerard from the, here it's told us that these guys don't share any divisors, but we could we don't know very well what, what the behavior of chi 12 is generically. But and it's transcendental divisor because the difference in Jacobi form you have to multiply chi zero by y plus p function. And its device is transcendental. Okay. But if they don't share them, then okay, yeah. But I wanted to understand better how they yes, we can uh, yeah. Because it seems like this guy has one and said equals zero. Uh, and, yes. and we just like... Okay. It's not a geometric device. It's actually we have device because it's more general form, but, but it has a transcendental form. I see. Yeah, but I'm worried that if some power defines... It's like it's zeros of uh, the Vice Cluster functions. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but basically this is what we're doing. So this is just a flavor of what we're doing. We're like, uh, there's a lot of mathematics here that is actually really, really interesting for the context of black holes. And, and, and the name of the game is understanding this behavior of these of coefficients. So what I have emphasized in the, in the talk 
is what happens in this regimes where I have a black hole that is, is very big. And we're still going, the case of H11 is the one that we have studied the most so far. Uh, and we're also considering other types of humber surfaces. The problem is that there the residues are a bit harder to read. Uh, H11 has, it's very easy to, to do the, the, the residue intervals. Uh, in this case, in other humber surfaces, it's more difficult, but not impossible. Uh, but then we also want to understand what happens, um, what we would call not the black hole part of the spectrum, but what we call the perturbative part of the spectrum. So in the language of, uh, so here for instance I emphasize on what is the growth when delta is very big, but you can also ask what is the growth of the coefficients when delta is small or even negative. So how do the negative discriminant states grow? And that's also really beautiful as well, and you can quantify that you can give actually exact formulas for the for your coefficients when the, the discriminant is, is negative. And, and that's what we're working on right now because and that also has that's also part of this dictionary, understanding what happens to what we will call the massless fields in the spectrum. Um, so yeah. And then there's wall crossing as well. So that all of these objects have very interesting wall crossing phenomena that I think has not been explored enough. And there's, a, there's a lot of physics included in here, so that's what we're doing. So, okay, now I'll shut up. Okay, thank you. As far as I remember, this object is called the second quantized elliptic genome. Yes. But to my mind... Uh, it's, a, it's a second quantized because you're starting over. Yeah, but uh, if I remember correctly, that in my mind emerged uh, in a different way through some uh, different type of schemes. Or originally it was introduced by a diagraphing company. Yeah, the DVD, Berlin, the Exactly in this way or through some tensoring. Uh, well, it's, well, it's, it's, it's more from, so it was second quantized because it looked more like this it's one, this product type formula. So it was introduced as this metric product of like uh, yeah, this is what I remember. So it's the same. Yeah. So these formulas this, and, this, and these formulas tend to have the same feature that you can you can uh, write them as the weighted part of the form and then as the metric product right. part of the form that is like heavy operators acting on the on the modular form. So yeah, you think of like it's because you have a stack of these brains. Several of them, and so, so the M is controlling. I'm trying to say that that formula was an interpretation of our Borges product yeah. formula. Yeah. 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 They were thinking of it as like, oh, you have several copies, and how do you count the, the, the number of states per copy? And so it was very convenient for them to think of them. Yeah, so it was. And another question is so what about flavored uh, lipid genomes? You can introduce more quantum numbers inside that guy, uh, flavor groups, and what would be the, in the black hole part? Yeah, so for instance, Arnav has been studying like these hot elliptic genus that yes. have like more flavors to it. Um, it that's very, it's very interesting, I, I'm very curious about uh, what to extract out of them because at least as Arnav tells me, their modular properties are suspect, they're well, it depends on how. Okay, it depends on which flavors we're adding. I, I, I mean, the more different, difficult. The flavor in the sense of the flavor groups in the standard case, linear sigma model, for instance. It's. Uh, but are you, are you thinking here that you have some SU two? Uh, well, the beginning, you get any, any flavor group, not the group, flavor group, so that you can have in the trace of the definition of your elliptic genus more capacities and more. Uh, they are external in a sense. Sure. If, if you know. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, if the, if the object is well defined here, then there's no problem. And from this point of view, um, I will have to be a bit careful, but it's doable to understand what the object will be. Uh, sometimes you can get just a black hole that has more conserved quantities associated to it. Yes. Or you could get objects like black rings. Uh, so, additional quantum numbers. Yeah, yeah so, so there's also, so, so the black hole is something that will have like spherical topology, but you can also get objects that have like donut uh, yeah, topology, and they look like dark of charges. So you, yeah, it's fun. If you, I'll, I would have to look at the details. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. Like On the other side, do you have some symmetry that exchanges here? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a symmetry. The spherical on this area. It's called electric magnetic duality. So the electric magnetic duality exchanges Q and P. So uh, this is the theory in four dimensions, and it's basically the fact that F, uh, there's a relationship between 
have a um, hot tool of the field strength. So it's an equal for electromagnetic duality. This one looks more like a fractional type duality, and so I, that's why it's also a little bit harder for me to identify what the supergravity is, because it's not a traditional symmetry that we deal with, because of this factor of t. But when t is 1, uh, it's just an exchange of, a, it's like the exchanging an electric charge by a magnetic monopole charge, like the direct. I have a very stupid question, I should ask before. The gravity is on 40, right? The generic The yeah, CFT is on 2, it should be I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, it is 2 uh, is not uh, one. It is it's 2 plus S2. It's because I have, so I have an AES2. Like you can fortify it at some No, so AES2, I left it up to an AES3. And I built the dictionary for, and then it's AES3, CFT2. The, the AES2 that I have in the 4D black hole, there's always a comes a Klein circle that I can go up one extra dimension where you, you can put it in a top knot space. And so what I'm doing is really uh, mapping this ADS2 into an ADS3 theory and then using the uh, map between ADS3 and CFT. And S2? The S2 doesn't do anything. Uh, it's just in the original frozen. split of the metric. Yeah, it's just frozen. It's completely, this is a direct product as well, so it just freezes there. No and this electromagnetic duality is something that is very external to the CFTs. It's hardly non trivial. Maybe CFTs it's, are enumerated by this. There's no reason why the energy and the index have to be related. It's completely. It, yeah, it's, yeah. And between this many CFTs, do you have some relation factorial in some way? Maybe? What's that? Like you have many uh, conformal frontiers enumerated by value of m. Mm -hmm. right? And can you relate one to another in some way like the symmetric power? Uh, they're related by any the the like the, there's an operation, if you give me a seed, I can generate the other ones. So from, from, the, from the smallest one. Yeah, so that, that's what this exponential left is basically it's telling okay. you. I mean, this is okay. 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 I'm sorry, you, you can do it for so okay. I have the following proposition. Now we have a chance for extra t, if we would like, as a continuous discussion. Then some small announcements for tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll work.